It's the biggest global health crisis for a generation. You're watching Coronavirus Explained, a BBC News special with me, Lucy Hawkins. The outbreak began in December in the central city of Wuhan, home to more than 11 million people. All these shops are closed. There's pretty much nobody on the street here. The infection is a new type of coronavirus. Put on a mask even if you are not ill because others may be. The World Health Organization declares a global health emergency as China's coronavirus This spread. metro network is pretty much empty. But now the new coronavirus has claimed its first victim outside Asia. Well, this is the exclusion zone now on the road to Kodonyo, the center of the outbreak. COVID-19 is a new virus to which no one has immunity. We'll be asking three key questions. What is it? What can you do? And what happens next? Our experts are here to help you navigate the complexities of coronavirus and to share their advice and to answer your questions. We'll also be asking how contagious is it and how worried should we be? The spread of misinformation and hysteria is a daily battle too. Who should we trust? And the impact on travel, should you be taking that next trip? That's all coming up in Coronavirus Explained. With us for the next 25 minutes are Dr Jake Dunning, he really is the man, Head of Emerging Infections at Public Health England and our Global Health Correspondent Tulip Mazumda. So, to our first question. Well, it's a disease a bit like flu. It's spread from China rapidly around the world. People can have it for about two weeks before symptoms appear and it passes from person to person through the air often through coughs and sneezes. So how do you know if you've got it? Well, among the symptoms, a fever, a dry cough and muscle pain. Jake, this sounds a lot like the flu. How is it different? So the viruses are very different. Uh, they're two completely different family of viruses, but the symptoms are actually quite similar. Um, so as you said, fever, dry cough, some people get muscle aches as well. Um, so the actual illnesses aren't that dissimilar. And there's no vaccine? There's, no, there's a vaccine for flu, and we also have some antiviral treatments for flu. We don't have those things yet for coronavirus. So, Tulip, if you have these symptoms that we've just shown people, should you go and get tested if you can in your country, or should you automatically stay at home and self-isolate? Well, what you do depends on where you are in the world. But if you are concerned that you have coronavirus, i.e. you've been to a country that's got lots of cases or you've been in touch with someone that you know has coronavirus, then a good idea would be to self-isolate. Here in the UK, for example, there's a 111 service. Uh, it's an online service, 111 NHS. You can also dial the number and they will give you good information elsewhere around the world. Yes, good idea. Self-isolate in the first instance. Contact your health provider on the phone. Uh, don't go in uh, and they will be able to give you some good advice. Well, Julie in Singapore recovered from the virus and she told us about her symptoms. When I was going through the, the critical stage, um, one of the things that I encountered was really breathing. Um, it, it felt um, my lungs were going in the overdrive. You were really making an effort. You know, it's not like normal days, right? When we don't even, we're not even conscious of how we breathe. It was just so laborious trying to get from my bed to the bathroom, which was like, I don't know, um, five meters away just walking to the bathroom and it was, it was just challenging. So good to see Julie has recovered. Jake, is breathing one of the main causes of concern? So certainly those who uh, get more sick, and that's only um, a small proportion of people, they can get quite difficult uh, problems with their breathing. Um, but that's uh, less than one in five people who, who will get that sort of severe illness where it really makes uh, it difficult to breathe and, and gives a really bad cough as well. And when you look at the figures, flu has killed so many more people this year than the coronavirus. Why are we so concerned? Why are we taking it so seriously? So this is a new virus, so very few people have immunity to this virus uh, so far because they haven't seen it before. Um, and also it's spreading quite a lot, quite quickly around the world. So uh, there's a potential for a lot of people to become infected very quickly and become infected before we've developed a vaccine and before we have effective treatments available. And it's older people that are the great concern at the moment. If that's the case, Jake, why are they shutting schools and universities? 
So in some countries, not all, they have made the decision to close schools and universities. Um, and that's based on how bad things are in their particular country and also what they think are the best measures at the time uh, uh, to put in place to try and control this. And it's really about trying to keep people apart. Once you try and do that, you really need to uh, think about closing things like schools and universities so that can happen. Well, let's take one of your questions now. Stephen in Sydney asks, what happens if the World Health Organization declares a pandemic, Tulip? Well, the World Health Organization isn't planning on declaring a global pandemic. They've said they've already declared an international public health emergency, and that is the highest uh, rate of uh, urgency that there is. Um, so declaring a pandemic wouldn't necessarily uh, change anything. What they say at the moment is that there are a number of linked epidemics in different parts of the world, uh, mainly in China, South Korea, Iran and Italy. In other countries, they say it's still containable. They say it's actually still containable internationally at this time and that at the moment this isn't a pandemic. Now, I must say, if you speak to some other scientists, they are saying that we are transitioning into that period of, of a pa global pandemic if we're not in one already. But the, what the World Health Organization says that practically what we do, nothing will change if you call it a pandemic. And actually that might just panic people and sort of some countries might just say, OK, well, it's here now. There's not much we can do when actually there is still a lot countries can do to contain this. This is really one of the key things, isn't it? What can we do? How can we minimise the chance of catching coronavirus? Well, the BBC's Michelle Roberts and Laura Foster have some ideas for us. Number one, wash your hands more. The more you wash your hands, the less likely you are to spread the virus to other people. So if you've been out in a public place, on a bus or a train, wash your hands as soon as you can afterwards. And when you're done, turn the tap off using a tissue and put it in the bin. Antibacterial gels do work, but soap and water is best. Number two, avoid touching your eyes, nose and mouth, because that's the way the virus could get into your body. You can still touch your face, but only if you've washed your hands before. Number three, catching your coughs and sneezes. Experts think coronavirus is spread by droplets that come out of your nose and mouth. So when you sneeze or cough, catch them with disposable tissues, then bin it and wash, wash your hands. hands. Disposable tissues are better than handkerchiefs that you carry around with you all the time. If you don't have a tissue, sneeze or cough into the crook of your elbow. <clears throat> don't touch things with your hands if you don't have to. The less you touch things like surfaces, handrails, lift buttons, the less likely you are to catch the virus or indeed spread it on. Well, because it is so important, it was a bit quick there, I thought, we're going to show you how to wash your hands properly. Tulip, you're going to time us, yes. timers of the essence. Mm -hmm. Jake, take it away. I'm going to roll my sleeves up so that uh, I can make sure that I get all of my hands and my wrists. I'm going to demonstrate with some alcohol gel, but the principles are the same. So what we're trying to do is cover as much of our hands and wrists as possible, whether it's soap and water or whether it's alcohol gel. So I'm going to put a good amount on and I'm going to start by... That's a lot more than I would have thought. Loads. OK, right, I'm going to do it too with you. I, yeah. I did overdo it slightly. <laughs> Every pump's different. So I'm going to rub it over and then back of my hands so my fingers yeah. are together. And then the other side. And then like this, fingers together, and then like this. So I'm trying to cover all of my fingers. Underneath jewellery and things as well. Yeah. yeah, and then people forget their thumbs stick out. Oh, uh, yeah. So good go on your thumbs. And then fingertips. We're still going, Sheila. You've just passed 20 seconds there. So. Sorry, it's because I'm talking. And then don't forget your wrists, finally. So it's 20 seconds the time, because... That felt like a long time. You can take as long as you want, but um, at least Is there a minimum? At minimum 20 seconds to get good coverage. So, Jake, I've touched so many surfaces today, when, from leaving home to being here. How often should I be washing my hands? So, um, as often as you can, really, within reason. Um, and certainly if you've uh, uh, touched lots of surfaces, so uh, if you've been out and about, it's um, good to have some alcohol gel with you if you have. But good old soap and water is good enough, certainly before eating. And um, if you think you need to touch your face, try and wash your hands before you touch your face. I mean, shops are selling out of this. What should we be looking for if we see it? What kind of 
percentages of alcohol should be in our sanitizer? So different types of hand sanitizer, most contain alcohol. You're looking for a minimum of 60%. Most will contain 70% alcohol or higher. So that will kill the coronavirus? That will. Okay, great. Well, let's uh, take another question. And this one comes from Claire in Singapore. She has a toddler and she says, I see a lot of people wearing masks and using sanitizer. How effective are these in stopping the spread of the virus? And how at risk are our children? So we have a mask here, Jake. Any good? So uh, this is what we call a, a surgical mask. It's quite a simple mask. Masks are really important for healthcare workers. But if you're um, a member of the general public, the evidence isn't great to show that they're going to protect you. Um, that's because um, when we use them, if we work in a hospital, we use them for a short period of time. We're trained in their use and uh, we get rid of them in a safe way. If you just have one of these on all day, um, you're probably trying to eat and drink wearing it. I've seen people with it worn like that, which is ineffective. Um, then people will take it off, have something to eat. They've contaminated the outside if they've got virus on their hands. Then they're putting it back on their face and potentially exposing themselves. So just to be clear, your advice is we don't need a mask. So our advice in England is that we don't recommend people wear masks to prevent getting infection. Sometimes we ask people who've got symptoms to put them on because they will stop some cough droplets coming out. And Tulip, to our question from Claire in Singapore, mm. what about children? So there is still a lot of research going on in this area and in fact many areas around uh, coronavirus but it does seem from some early studies, a study that involved around 44,000 people who got the coronavirus um, in China, that the risk to children does seem to be a little bit lower. About 1% of children and young people, so under 20s, uh, were infected with this coronavirus. So it's a similar thing for them. Of course you need to make sure that they're washing their hands regularly, that they're you know, staying clean and they're not touching lots of surfaces Difficult That's with kids, <laughs> difficult with kids, but just make sure, you know, and it's not just the hand sanitizer, use soap and water. I mean, you know, everyone's Sing got access to that. And row, row your boat. Row, row your boat, yeah. Twice. A good earworm. Yeah. Okay. That's how you know the 20 seconds, because it's obviously hard to figure that out when you're... Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, thanks both. Well, there is a lot of damaging misinformation out there. We've all seen it. It's contributing to the panic, the sense of fear that we have. So let's join Roz now on where you should be getting your information from. Roz. Lucy, thank you very much indeed. Now, ever since this new coronavirus was identified in December, we've been dealing what's, with what's been called a new viral threat, not the virus itself, but misinformation, by which I mean reports and advice that are either incorrect, misleading, or completely false. For example, one theory that just won't go away is that this virus came from a Chinese lab. Here's the Washington Times in January reporting that COVID-19 could be connected to a Chinese biowarfare program. Or there's this in February from the New York Post, an opinion piece under the headline, Don't Buy China's Story, The Coronavirus May Have Leaked From a Lab. But there is no evidence to back this up. However, as with a lot of misinformation, there are some grains of truth in there. This outbreak did originate in Wuhan in China, and in that city you'll find the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which is a high-security biolab. But, and this is a very big but, here's the medical journal The Lancet documenting how scientists have analysed this virus, and they've all concluded it came from wildlife and wasn't engineered in a lab. And so, if wildlife is the suspected source. There's been a huge amount of attention on this live animal and seafood market also in Wuhan. Because one theory is that the virus originated in bats that were being sold there. And it's true, that is one possible explanation. This though, will not help you understand that. It's a video of a woman eating bat soup that went very viral in the last couple of months, with many people blaming this kind of dish for the virus. Except, as this article in the South China Morning Post notes, that video is three years old and it's not from Wuhan. Now this article from the Centre for Disease Control helps us on this issue. It outlines how this disease could spread from animals to humans. That can happen via direct or indirect contact or via pests, water or food. So soup may have been involved but not the one in this video and quite possibly not at all. Next there's the issue of advice bad advice. For example, here's a Facebook group telling us if you eat a bowl of boiled garlic, that could cure the virus. It can't. You'll be well aware of lots of people buying these, surgical face masks. Doctors are telling us they aren't going to help you to avoid the virus. And these are just some of hundreds of examples. I should say, 
There is good advice out there. You could look at the website for the Centre for Disease Control. Also check out the WHO's myth-busting page. And of course, there's the BBC News website with an awful lot of verified information about what's happening and what to do. But there's no doubt, Lucy, that as the WHO director says, we're not just fighting an epidemic, we're fighting an infodemic. Ros, thank you so much. Uh, Jake and Tulip here, very happy to see some of those uh, myths being busted as well. But I think one of the things many of us are tackling every day, Jake, is whether we should be changing our daily lives and what we do. I mean, should we be going to the movies, taking our kids to birthday parties? Should I have given you a hug and a kiss? Hello, or Tulip, who I know quite well, or should all of that stop? So ordinarily, I'd say yes, obviously, but... Um uh, it depends where you are in the world at the moment as to what you should do, but we should all be thinking about how our lives may need to change, not forever, but for a short period. So, for example, how's my life changed in the UK at the moment? I'm not shaking hands with people anymore. That's my personal choice. How are you doing this? I'm doing an elbow bump or a foot tap, um, uh, which I think is a, a, a good idea. It's something easy I can do. Um, it doesn't offend anybody that I don't shake their hand anymore. Um, there will be other things if this gets bigger in my own country going forward um, about trying to keep uh, uh, distance from other people. Social to, distancing. Social distancing. And it all depends on how big it gets, how many people are infected. So there are lots of plans to try and uh, work out when that may happen and then what actions need to be taken. So it's important to listen to the authorities in your own country and listen to their advice. OK, well, as we've mentioned, some schools around the world are shut and many big sporting events have been postponed. Businesses as well are changing the way they work. Let's take you to Singapore now. They had some of the first cases of COVID-19 outside China, so in many ways they are ahead of the curve. And what's happening there now may well become the reality for a lot of countries. Here's Karishma Vaswani. Business as usual, under unusual conditions. I'm at Singapore's largest telecommunications firm. And as you can see, adding new precautions into everyday life has become part of the routine here. These thermal scanners are now a common fixture across buildings in Singapore. If your temperature is above 37.5 or 38 degrees Celsius, they're not going to let you in. Morning. Turns out I'm okay. But what companies are really worried about is business continuity. How to keep operations running while keeping their staff safe. Some companies have asked their employees to work from home, but that can be challenging, especially if you have young kids running around. Others have adopted the split shift strategy, which means two groups of employees never see each other. It's been great for tech firms providing services like online training, virtual conferences and virtual meetings. And for some companies, productivity has actually gone up with happier employees enjoying their time working from home. With most people not traveling for work or conducting their business meetings online, the airlines and travel industry, they're suffering too. Frankly, we still don't know just how much the coronavirus is going to cost the world. But one thing's for sure, it's forcing all of us to take a deeper look at how we work in a globally connected world. Well, we've had lots of questions about traveling from all over the world. Simon Calder is here. Simon? <laughs> We're going to take a question from Sean from New Jersey. He asks, I'm going skiing in the French Alps later this month. What happens if the error is placed under quarantine while I'm there? Will travel insurance cover it, Simon? We're in uncharted territory. Sean, I must say, please be very careful. You could well be driving in twisting mountain roads in terrible conditions. You're going to be going down a mountain very swiftly on skis. This is real risk. The tiny possibility that you might be in proximity to somebody with the coronavirus, I think is not really worth worrying about. But given that it is a possibility that you will be kept in some lovely Alpine village, the evidence we've seen, and there aren't that many exemplars, is that you will be fed and watered and your airline at the end of this unfortunate uh, incarceration will be flexible and get you home to uh, New Jersey um, without too much fuss. So how often are you saying to people, Simon, no, I don't think you should travel right now? Oh, well, you, you, if your government says 
Country X, Region Y is too dangerous, don't go there. Apart from anything else, it will generally invalidate your travel insurance. But everywhere else, it's a wonderful time to be a traveller. And if you look globally at all the risks, top of the list, of course, is uh, uh, road accidents, which claim nearly 4,000 victims a day worldwide. It's still the case that travel has never been safer. Yes, the coronavirus is a worry. Yes, each of the nearly uh, 4,000 deaths have been a tragedy, but it is still not a significant risk, at least in my risk. So given the advice differs from country to country, what's the one piece of advice that you've been giving people, Simon? Well, if you're in one of the vulnerable groups, you're an older traveller or you've got a weakened immune system, then be circumspect and have a look at where the threats are. Otherwise, just um, if your government says it's OK to travel somewhere, go there. It's wonderful. Have a lovely time. Jake, what about when you get on board that aeroplane? Should you be quickly sanitising the seat? Should you turn off the air vent? Is there something you should be doing on board of an aeroplane? You should relax and enjoy your journey, really. <laughs> um, so planes are clean regularly. They're clean very professionally. Um, uh, use your hand sanitizer gel if you've got it. Wash your hands. Be mindful of your hand hygiene. Washing our hands, keeping our hands clean is the most important thing we can do to stop the spread of this virus. And Simon, are airlines changing their policies as well around cancellation fees? Uh, they are, whatever? but they're doing it in quite an unhelpful way. What they're trying to do is stimulate bookings. So in the past few days, we've seen a rush of airlines saying, hey, everybody, book your flight. And if you need to change it, we'll allow you to do that without the usual uh, change fee. Um, that doesn't apply regrettably to uh, previous um, uh, trips that you might have organised and a lot of people are feeling very bitter about that but again just go travel is good for the body it's good for the soul and it's very good for the host community as well it enriches everybody absolutely the economic implications of not traveling are quite big Jake big question here is science going to come to the rescue where are we at with a vaccine uh, so uh, vaccines are being studied and being developed, um, but they are months away. So we're probably talking six to 12 months before anything becomes available. There's lots of other research going on, um, in, including looking at potential treatments for those people who do become unwell. Tulip, what's your big message to people who are nervous or worried? I think being nervous and worried is completely natural and normal. Um, prepare yourself and inform yourself. So it's great we're doing this program. There's lots of information online. There's the one thing every single person can do, and that's obviously washing their hands regularly, as we've seen, for 20 seconds, several times a day. But it's also important to remember that the World Health Organization is saying, look, this thing can still be contained. We saw what happened with China. There were so many cases. It was looking very frightening there. And actually, cases are in decline now. We are seeing these hotspots popping up in other parts of the world now, which is a major concern. Of course it is. But there is still hope there from some of the world's leading scientists that this thing can still be contained. How is it going to be brought under control, Jake? Because in China, they were draconian measures that really can't be implemented in every country. True, I agree with that, but we can all do our bit. So this is about a sort of global responsibility, being good members of society. So yes, if you do get it, likelihood is that you'll get a very mild illness, but you may pass that illness on to people who could get more serious illness. So the more we can do now to stop our infection from spreading to other people, the better. So that means uh, uh, making sure that you catch your sneezes and your coughs in tissues, getting rid of them in the bin, uh, washing your hands, uh, not only after blowing your nose, um, but as often as you can. Um, and if you have symptoms, make sure that you follow the advice, which in the UK would be to self-isolate, get yourself away from people, and then seek help by, uh, for example, calling our helpline in the UK. But Jake, what is the potential of the coronavirus? How bad could it get? So um, based on what, what we have uh, the, the information available at the moment has come from China, really. And as Tulip said, that they have been through uh, a, a significant ordeal recently, but their containment uh, efforts seem to have made an impact on uh, the duration of this virus in parts of China. So um, we do need to keep containing, but the likelihood is that a lot of people around the world will get this infection. What kind of percentage are we uh, looking at? We, I mean, we, are most of us going to get it in a minor way? So uh, we don't know yet. There are um, some predictions and there are ranges of predictions. Some say as high as 80% uh, of people may get the infection. But remember, the majority of those people who are infected will still get mild illness based on what we've seen in China. And how big an issue is the underreporting? of coronavirus, particularly in countries like Iran, Tulip? It is a 
it is a major concern and, and again the World Health Organization right from the start of this outbreak was saying the world needs to come together, everybody needs to be really open about what's happening, happening in their country. What we're seeing in Iran is a significant number of cases and the largest amount, a number of deaths outside of uh, China uh, and it's also because of the sanctions that are there, because of some secrecy with that country as well. There just seems to be quite an unclear picture and it needs to be absolutely clear as, it, as clear as it can be. Information needs to be shared internationally because if one country drops the ball, then the rest of the world will be I mean, impacted. briefly, Jake, are you worried that some health systems simply won't cope? So, um, we are worried. The WHO is worried as well. Um, and everyone is working very hard to try and support the countries with less well-developed healthcare systems and with fewer resources. So, again, it comes back to that global community helping each other. Okay. Well, it has been an information-rich 25 minutes. I hope you've found it useful. If you want to find out more, of course, please go to BBC Online. We also have uh, plenty of information on our news app for you as well. It is all there for you. So our thanks to Jake, to Tulip and to Simon as well. Your information has been invaluable. Thank you so much. And thank you for watching. And I think the message from all of us is keep washing your hands, everyone. <laughs> and thank don't you. panic. And don't panic.